I'd like to start by saying that I do not want to be an alarmist today, but we are in danger. In fact, we have always been in danger, and we will always be in danger around us, on us, in us. There are uncountable viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, parasites looking for a minor breach in our defenses in order to invade us, take over our bodies and benefit from us. The whole history of humanity has been shaped by infectious diseases. The Antonin Plague took the life of five million individuals during the Roman Empire, including one emperor. The Plague of Justinian, named after the uh, Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian I, killed 40 million people in the 6th century. The medieval Black Death cut short the life of 100 million individuals in the 14th century. 100 years ago, the Spanish flu outbreak killed 1 million people per week. And more recently, with the outbreak of HIV, 30 million people have died of AIDS. And still today, 35 million people are careers of the infection all over the world, many of them with an unfortunate prognosis, with 750,000 deaths in the year 2018. Other diseases, such as tuberculosis, malaria, or fungal diseases, still kill millions of individuals around the world. And every few years, we also experience the outbreak of some new diseases, such as we see now, with the world-famous and infamous coronavirus. Well, this might sound scary, right? To says, we are gonna die of so, but this is not new. This has happened throughout the whole history of humanity. Since the very dawn of mankind, there has been a constant interplay, a constant interaction between humans and pathogens that is the engine of our evolution. This orbits around a very simple principle. If we acquire an infection before we reach reproductive age, and we die, we don't pass on our genes to the future generations. We were not resistant enough. We were not adopted, so our genes die with us. However, if we were resistant and we survived the infection, we will have the opportunity to reproduce and to pass on their genes to future generations. This is good for us. This is good for our descendants. And this is good for the overall survival of our species. Because the past influences the present and our ancestors form the heritage and the legacy of humanity of today in many aspects, including the response to diseases. The majority of experts agree that Africa is the place where our species originated. Studies suggest connections with ancestors who lived in this continent about 300,000 years ago. And pathogens have played a central role in human evolution from those very early times. Probably the most well-known example of a disease that has an impact on human evolution is that of malaria. Malaria has been present in African communities for hundreds of thousands of years. And these communities, their genome, their physiology, have been shaped by the severity of these infections. Malaria is caused by a parasite, a parasite that is transmitted to humans through the bite of infected mosquitoes. Once the parasites enter our body, 
they entered the red blood cells and multiplied inside them. However, some people have a special type of red blood cells that makes them resistant to disease. So we observe that in many African populations, in places where malaria is endemic, there are many people with this kind of special red blood cells that makes them resistant to the disease. How does this happen? Well, this is evolution. This is a tale of natural selection. Let's imagine we have an original population with five different characteristics, with five different traits represented on the slide by five different colors. At the beginning, the original population has more or less the same amount of individuals with each of these different characteristics. At a certain point, a critical event, such as a deadly disease, appears, causing a bottleneck in the population, the survival of the fittest. Only those with good characteristics will survive, while the others will perish. The remaining population, the survivors, will have the opportunity to reproduce and to expand their advantageous traits and then give rise to a new population, to new generations adapted to the infection. This is just one example of this influence. And in the case of malaria, there are a handful of traits that confer an advantage to infection. So people who have normal erythrocytes, normal red blood cells, are susceptible to have malaria. But people who have sickle cells, which are red blood cells with a specific shape and different properties, are resistant to malaria because the parasite cannot enter these red blood cells. So we observe that in places where malaria is endemic, there are many people with sickle cells because it is an advantage, an evolutionary advantage, to survive malaria. And the grounds of this influence have the roots in processes that took place hundreds of thousands of years ago, because the past influences the present. However, we don't live in the same way in which our ancestors lived. They have nothing to do the way we live, in which even the way our grandparents live. And this also has consequences today. In the last centuries, and especially in the last decades, improvements in the means of transport have allowed humans to travel faster and more distant than ever before. We have seen some incredible inventions in the last years. We have now antibiotics, we have electricity, we have robots, we have rockets, we even have ice cream. And I mean, we have seen the birth, and sometimes even contributed to the expansion of some incredible res recent inventions, such as the reggaeton and Tinder, that also help humans to pass on their genes to future generations. <laughs> And thanks to these and many other advances, our lifespan, the lifespan of many countries, including the Netherlands, has doubled in just one century. Our society is experiencing global changes at a speed never seen before in the whole history of humanity. But evolution is a slow process. So all these sudden changes have consequences. Changes in hygiene patterns in the last decades have brought us large improvements in sanitation, drinking water, garbage collection, etc., that have greatly reduced our exposure to infectious diseases. And the immune system of our ancestors is our immune system. So it's my immune system, your immune system, your immune system, the immune system of the person who is on the last row are under the influence of these processes. And all our immune systems 
need a certain degree of exposure to microbes and dirt for the correct development of immunity. The hygiene hypothesis proposes that the lack of exposure to germs and dirt is associated with a higher risk of developing asthma and allergies, as we see nowadays. What consequences does this have, for example, for our children? So, children who grow at farms, who are much more exposed to microbes and dirt, develop much less, much less allergies and asthma. So please, to all those people who have kids here or are thinking to have kids, take them to the park. Let them play in farms, let them play with animals, let them crawl on the floor, because it's actually good for them and for the future. Likewise, the expression of genes related with inflammation is also related with the increase we see nowadays in inflammatory diseases. So we see nowadays that many diseases related with inflammation are spreading, such as autoimmune or anti-inflammatory diseases. This also has to do with the functions or our, of our immune system. We see now, as we are adapting to processed food and stricter hygiene standards, our bodies react by developing the so-called diseases of civilization. This kind of diseases, as I've just mentioned before, are related with this excessive inflammation we suffer under these conditions. So for example, we observe now in many countries high rates of diabetes, celiac disease, or inflammatory bowel disease. And this is already a major health issue in Western countries. But since we are also experiencing times of globalization, many other countries, many other societies are embracing our lifestyles, and this is causing big problems. For example, in Africa, where people have been in contact with more powerful and terrible diseases for longer periods of time, the inflammatory responses are higher. So they have exacerbated responses in their immune system. <laughs> this was useful for our ancestors to fight those powerful infections. But today, in our more sterile environment, it causes inflammation. And this is also related with higher rates of diseases such as lupus, asthma, heart diseases, and some types of cancer in African populations. So, if the globalization of the sedentary Western lifestyles continues, it will collide with the inflammatory consequences of our past, creating a major health issue worldwide. So we better stop it before it's too late. Because we, what we do today has consequences for the next generations. This not only concerns issues like climate change, but also involves how we live, the diseases we get, the vaccinations we get as well, and the, uh, and the diseases we suffer, how we treat our children, and so on. I would like to give you one very particular example of this, probably familiar to many of you. The Dutch hunger winter. In the autumn of 1944, during the Second World War, German troops blocked the western part of the country, turning away all shipments of food. The situation was followed by one of the hardest winters in decades, with terrible colds and many people surviving on just 500 calories a day. The hunger winter as it is known, killed 10,000 people and weakened many more. But there was a specific population who was affected by this situation. 40,000 women were pregnant during the Dutch hunger winter. So the fetuses developed under very restrictive caloric conditions. This had consequences that were obvious right after birth, 
with low birth weights, birth defects, and high infant mortality. But some other consequences were not visible until many years later. So, decades after the hunger winter, researchers showed that individuals who had gestated under these conditions, so individuals whose mothers were pregnant during the Dutch hunger winter, had higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease than individuals who had gestated under normal conditions. It seems that those fetuses adapted their metabolism and their physiological processes in anticipation of the harsh environment that was waiting for them outside. Well, you might say this is logical. The body adapts. Yes, that is true, but it doesn't stop here. This goes one step beyond, because also the grandchildren of those women who were pregnant present these characteristics. So there is a dynamic adaptation to the environment that has consequences for the next generations. All these examples show that there is a balance. Humans build defenses to fight diseases. But we can't stop disease from happening. So what makes us stronger on one hand can also make us weaker on the other hand. We can't forget that we are the heirs of those people who wandered around the world looking for a better place to live. We are the heirs of a long tradition of survivors of terrible diseases that made our species stronger, but also more vulnerable to the current changes of our lifestyle. And knowing our past will prepare us for the future. Thank you very much.